Sunday school? Are you kidding me? I got the wrong class. <laughs> no, seriously, it's Sunday school. You know, we're studying discipleship materials. We're learning to grow up to be men and women of God, as well as sons and daughters, as well as being like little children. Well, you get the metaphor. One of the things that I find interesting about knowing Jesus in a personal and intimate way is that there are times that, you, you know, you, you grow up into a man of God, you know, and you wander around acting like you're God, you know. And there are times you act like, you know, a woman of God. No, I'm kidding. I don't act like a woman of God. Leave my wife out of this. But, you know, she'll say, that, well, you're more feminine than I am. And I'll say, well, you're more manly than I am. But I'm just kidding. But a certain amount of it's true. Because I have emotions and she has, you know, her way of dealing with things. <laughs> but my point is simply this. God covers us all. God has it all covered. He's taking care of it all. He's provided it all. He's given us everything we need for godliness, for holiness, for righteousness, for salvation, for learning how to be who we ought to be. Because I don't know about you, but I'd rather get everything I got coming to me and everything God wants to give me than to kind of like be hanging around you know, operating with maybe one hand tied behind my back, you know, or limping along like, you know, as though I really should be running the race. So that's why we have Sunday school. is isn't just because, you know, it's something nice to do. It isn't like it's some kind of Bible study, although some Sunday schools are. But it's to get to the nitty-gritty, the nuts and bolts of where we're at, of who we are, what we are, why we are, the way we are. You know, and how to get beyond where we are, because guess what? Who you are may not be where you want to be by tomorrow, because you see, God wants to work in you and me to make us into the image of his son. So, unless you're perfect, I don't know, I think maybe we ought to stick with Sunday school. So we're using in our Sunday school text, you know, this book called Handbook for Christian Maturity by Bill Bright, which was a combination of a couple of books that he wrote in the early Jesus movement for Campus Crusade for Christ. And Campus Crusade for Christ was originally designed for discipleship, so we're using those materials that would help us and to inspire us to get to know Jesus better than who we know and how we know him today. For me, most people I know, they don't hear him, they don't talk to him, they kind of got this idea and they're very religious. And I have to say, they are very good at being religious. And so we have a Sunday school class like this for the religious. But there's also people that are like me that are kind of frivolous. You know, we're just like, hey, you know, we trust the Lord, man. We're going for it. You know, I'd go walk on water, go heal the sick, go raise the dead, go do whatever, you know. Get that mountain out of the way. No problem, man. We're construction, you know. Well, destruction. Okay, Lord, take care of it. You know, one way or another, we're just kind of like, you know, going for it. We're, you know, out there all the time because we want to be up there when God calls us to be out of here so that we Go there, you know, to be with the Lord. And I would rather be about the Lord's business than to be about any other business there is in the world. So that's why, for some of us, we have Sunday school. Now, for others, you know, you don't know anything about the Bible. You know, you've never read it. You never heard it. You never understood it. You've never been to class. You never looked at it. You never really considered the Bible at all. Sunday school, and that's where we're at. We've been giving kind of an overview. We gave a syllabus in our first tape, and in the second tape, we kind of gave an overview of it, and today we're getting actually into some nitty-gritty and some nuts and bolts. Now, it's not really going to be the beginning of the class, because we still have this last part, that's the beginning introduction, to get into and to go over so that we can get into it next week, but this is a good summary of all the books of the Bible that you might want to consider. I know for myself, I was um, very interested in something Chuck Smith did. It was uh, based upon this teaching and this factual happening in the book of, well, I think it's the book of Acts. But um, no, it's not the book of Acts, it's Matthew and, and also Luke. That Jesus was found to be walking with two of his disciples who had left Jerusalem, you know, because they were discouraged. And he went walking with them from where they were at, where he met them, to where they were going to spend the night, which was a you know, pretty good walk.
but it says that he expounded to them the scriptures and how the Messiah must die and be raised from the dead. And he spoke to them and gave to them the, his knowledge base, which is typically Jewish. I mean, you know, oral traditions and oral history was something that every Jew knew how to do. But Jesus, being the one that was giving it, being the person who inspired all the writers of the Bible and gave them all the words to write and to record, that must have been some Bible study. So he was able to go from Genesis all the way through to Revelation and explain to and expound to them, or maybe not Revelation yet, but explain to them and expound to them the Word of God. Chuck Smith one night on a Sunday night did the same thing. He started in Genesis and he worked his way all the way through to Revelation. I think it was called the Scarlet Thread of Redemption, but he spoke of every single book of the Bible. And it was interesting because he took a, it was like a synopsis or an overview like we're going to read. I don't know what kind of outline they have here for that, but it's going to be a brief explanation of the books. But he was able to show the way of salvation and Jesus in each one of the books all the way through until Revelation. I was dumbfounded. And then one night when I was doing something, and I don't remember where I was teaching or what I was doing, but God did it with me. And I was like, I almost, you know, I did record it. But I wish I had, because <laughs> I don't know that I could do that today. <laughs> I have a hard enough time going Genesis, Exodus, Genesis, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua, Judges, Ruth, Samuel, Samuel, King, King, Chronicles, Chronicles, Ezra, Nehemiah, Esther. And then I get stuck right after Esther, because then it's like the poetic books, so I'm going, ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. But I used to have them all memorized, but then, you know, it's like, who cares? <laughs> you know what I mean? God knows. God brings it there when you need it. And the same thing is true, that if I needed to go through every book of the Bible, then I probably could. But we are going to look at, right now, the summary of the books of the Bible. So, Father, I just pray that you'll give us a good day, a good word, a good inspiration, a good knowledge, a good witness, that we can have this Sunday school together and enjoy your presence. So, Jesus, just come and be here. Just come and lead here. Just come and sit with us and be inside us and abide with us as we go through your book, your history, and your word. In Jesus' name, amen. And so let's look at this now and get our Sunday school lesson on with the next one, which will be, let me give you kind of a sneak preview. What is the next lesson? Let's see, okay, the next one will be the introductory step, uniqueness of Jesus. Woohoo! We'll finally begin into the Word of God and into the, the first Sunday school lesson of, wow, that looks pretty interesting. Can you hold that thought for a minute? I want to get into the study. Okay, never mind. But we'll get back to the summary. Okay, let's get into the summary, and we'll just take it from where Bill Bryce got us, and we'll go from there. Summary of the books of the Bible. Old Testament. The Old Testament was written to create an anticipation of and pave the way for the coming of Jesus. Oh, I already like this guy. Yeah. Mm. Woohoo! Talk about being a Jesus freak. Let's read that again. That is a good line. The Old Testament was written to create an anticipation of and pave the way for the coming of Jesus. It is the story of the Hebrew nation, largely dealing with events and exigencies, exigencies of its own time. But all through the story, there runs unceasing expectancy of the coming of one majestic person who will rule and do a great and wonderful work in the whole world. This person, long before he arrived, came to be known as the Messiah. The predictions of his coming constitute the messianic strain of the Old Testament. They form the golden thread extending through and binding together its many diverse books into one amazing unity. That's taken from uh, the Bible Handbook, by the way. Uh, Haley's by Henry Armstrong, I guess, by page 346. And I think I might even have the Bible Handbook. Uh, Haley's Bible Handbook, let's see, what's it say, uh, page, see, right here, page 346, uh, let's see, page 346, in case you're wondering what I'm doing, you know, is that, uh, I don't trust you, <laughs> I trust in the Lord, I don't trust you, so you think I trust the book? Not a chance, I do this every day. Matter of fact, I do it on just about everybody, and any place, and any time that someone tells me something, because it's like, you're right. Where does it say that? So I kind of want to know where it said that. So I look at page 346, and I go, okay. Let's see, we got, boy, is that small print. Page 346, and let's see, that says 346? Yeah, page 346, Bible Handbook, Haley, okay. And it says, predictions of his coming constitute 
This is a continuous of the prophecy of chapter 2, 10 horns, so the interpretation, at least, to show it's God, idea, time periods, and let's see, Haiti Bible Handbook. Interesting. Huh. Or Halley's Bible Handbook. New revised edition. This is probably an older edition. Oh well. We'll have to check that out. I'm going to go look at that up and find it and see if it's there. Henry H. Is this by Henry H? This is an old one too. Halley's. Well, as we do, prove all things, hold fast that which is good. So while I like the quote, I question the source. And that's one thing that you should always do in every Sunday school and in every class and in every word of God and every will and every time somebody quotes a scripture to you. I personally catch people on the internet all the time misquoting the Bible. Don't do that. I'll catch you. No, But seriously, look things up. Prove all things. Examine them. This is your faith. This is the reality of what you have to do in these latter days. People are misusing, misquoting, and abusing the Word of God all the time. I think this isn't quite what I think it is, but, you know, it's just an accidental whatever or something. But, hey, it could happen. So, anyways, I'll look it up later, and I'll get back to you on it about this particular summary. Now, the Pentateuch is the Greek word for the first five books of the Old Testament written by Moses, also called the Law. Genesis means book of beginnings. It contains the story of the creation of the world, the fall of man, the flood, the calling out of Abraham, and the formation of the Hebrew nation. The main characters are Adam, Noah, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Joseph. Exodus means going out. It contains the Egyptian bondage of the Hebrews, their deliverance through Moses, the giving of the law, and the building of the tabernacle. Leviticus means pertaining to Levites. That is, the book contains the system of laws administered by the Levitical priesthood under which the Hebrew nations lived. It is a book full of rules and regulations. Numbers means numbering, and it contains the numbering of the Hebrews, about two million people. They were placed into tribes and were given specific tasks. It also contains the story of their wanderings in the wilderness for 40 years because of the unbelief that God would cast out the heathen people so they could enter the promised land. Deuteronomy means this is the copy for repetition of the law. It consists of the parting counsels of Moses delivered to the Jews in view of their impending entrance upon their covenant possession, the promised land. During the 40 years of wilderness, wanderings, a new generation of people had arisen. They, along with Joshua and Caleb of the past generation, were the only ones allowed to enter the land. Deuteronomy 1, 21-39. The historical books tell of the rise and fall of the commonwealth of Israel. Joshua means Jehovah saves. It contains the conquest of Canaan, or Canaan, the Promised Land, the crossing of the Jordan, the fall of Jericho, the victories over the Canaanites, or Canaanites, the sun was made to stand still, and the tribes settled in the land. Judges contains the theme, every man did that which was right in their own eyes. There was no king, no system of government, no monarchy. The Israelites were to live in the land and serve God, but they failed. The country was infiltrated with heathen people, and idolatry abounded. Ruth is the story of the faithfulness and love of a woman of a woman. Its purpose, one, is to show that during the times of apostasy, time of the judges, there were individuals serving God. Two, to show the founding of the messianic family. And three, to illustrate their principle of redemption. First Samuel presents the personal history of Samuel, last of the judges. It also contains the establishment of a monarchy under Saul, the failure of Saul, and the introduction of David. 2 Samuel marks the restoration of order through the enthroning of God's king, David. God established the great Davidic covenant, out of which the eternal kingdom of the Messiah was to come. 
1 Kings contains the reign of Solomon, the building of the temple, and the division of the kingdom under Rehoboam and Jeroboam, or Yechroboam and Rehoboam, and was head of the southern kingdom commonly called Yehuda or Judah. And its main center was Yerushalayim, or Jerusalem. Yeroboam was head of the northern kingdom, commonly called Israel, or Israel, and its main center was Samaria. Sam Samaria. Samar, 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 Samaria. 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 Second Kings contains the story of the two kingdoms and their final captivity. The southern kingdom, Yehuda or Judah, was pro conquered and brought into captivity into Babylon, or Babylon. <laughs> Babylon, Babyloni. The northern kingdom, and that's a joke, that's not the way you pronounce it. <laughs> the northern kingdom, Israel, was conquered and brought into captivity by Assyria. 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 Chronicles contains the reign of David. It is told from a religious point of view. Second Chronicles contains the reign of Solomon and the reigns of Rehoboam, Jeroboam, and other kings who follow. It is told from a religious point of view. Ezra is... Ezra is the story of the return of Jewish remnant to Jerusalem, the restoration of law and ritual, and the rebuilding of the temple. Nehemiah is the Nehemiah. <laughs> I like using the phonetic. It's the story of the rebuilding of the walls of Jerusalem and the restoration of civil authority. Esther was a Jewess who became queen of Persia. Though a remnant had returned to Jerusalem, the majority of the nation had preferred to remain under the Persian rule. This book is the story of how Esther, the queen, through the providence of God, kept the Jewish nation from being exterminated. The political books are the books of the human experiences of the people of God under the various exercises of earthly life. Job is, the form, is in the form of a dramatic poem. It is probably the oldest of the books of the Old Testament and deals with the problems, why do the godly suffer? Psalms, you know, why do good things happen to bad people, or why do bad things happen to good people? Psalms is the Hebrew hymn book. The great themes of the Psalms are the Messiah, Jehovah, the law, creation, and the future of Israel, and the exercises of the renewed heart in sufferings and joy and perplexity. Psalms were to be used in private and public worship. Proverbs consists of wise sayings about life, especially emphasizing righteousness and the fear of God. Ecclesiastes is the book of man's reasonings about life and the vanity of it without God. Song of Solomon is the story of the love of a bride and a bridegroom, symbolic of the love of Christ for the church. Yeah. Prophetical books. Prophets were men raised up of God in times of apostasy. They were primarily revivalists and patriots speaking on behalf of God to the heart and conscience of the nation. The prophetic messages have a twofold character. First, that which was lo local and for the prophet's time, and second, that which was predictive of the divine purpose in the future. Major prophets, so called because of the size of the books. Isaiah, Ishiahu, or Ishiah, Ishiah, Ishiah doesn't matter. So called because of the size of the books. You see, Isaiah is considered to be the prince of the Old Testament prophets. He was thoroughly imbued with the idea that his nation was to be a messianic nation to the world. He prophesied to Judah, the southern kingdom. Jeremiah's ministry, Yermiahu, Yermia, ministry extended over the last 40 years of the kingdom of Judah, the destruction of Jerusalem, and the deportation of its inhabitants to Babylon. His orders constitute uh, stern warnings to Judah to abandon idolatry and apostasy to escape the inevitable consequence of Babylonian captivity. Lamentations woo consists of five poems lamenting the destruction of Jerusalem at the time of the Babylonian captivity. It was written by Jeremiah. Ezekiel prophesied during the Babylonian captivity and his mission was to instruct the Israelites that God was just in permitting the captivity of his people, and that eventually the nation would be restored. Daniel prophesied during the Babylonian captivity. His book is indispensable to New Testament prophecy, the themes of which are the apostasy of the church, the great tribulation, the return of Jesus, the resurrection, and the judgments. His vision sweeps the whole course of Gentile world rule to its end in catastrophe and to the setting up of the Messianic kingdom. Minor prophets, so-called because the books are shorter. Hosea 
was a prophet to the northern kingdom, Israel. At the same time, Isaiah was prophesying to the southern kingdom. His book is the prophecy of God's unchanging love for Israel, and Israel is pictured as an adulterous wife shortly to be put away, but eventually to be purified and restored. Joel was a prophet to the southern kingdom. He warns the nation to repent in the light of approaching judgment. He also stirs up the faithful among the people to believe the promises of God involved in coming salvation and destruction of the enemies of God's kingdom. Amos prophesied to the northern kingdom when it was at its height. Fiery denunciation of luxurious living and idolatry and moral depravity of Israel were the subjects of his messages. Obadiah is a denunciation of the Edomites, bitter enemies of the Jews, predicting their forthcoming decimation. Jonah was a prophet called of God to testify to Nineveh, the capital of the Syrian Empire. The book teaches that God's grace goes beyond his chosen people and that it reaches out to embrace the heathen nations. Micah was a message to both Israel and Judah stressing their sins, their destruction, and their restoration. Nahum, Nahum was a message of judgment to Nineveh predicting their destruction. Jonah, Jonah's was a message of mercy. Nahum's was a message of doom. Together they illustrate God's way of dealing with the nations extending grace but punishing continued sin by judgment. Habakkuk was a prophet who was more concerned that the holiness of Jehovah should be vindicated than that Israel should be escaped judgment. It is written on the eve of the Babylonian captivity. Zechariah prophesied right before the Babylonian captivity. He told of the judgments which were to come, the captivity for Israel and the eventual judgments of nations, followed by was that Zechariah and Zephaniah? I think it's Zephaniah. Zephaniah prophesied right before the Babylonian captivity. He told of the judgments which were to come, captivity for Israel, and eventually the judgment of nations, followed by the blessings of the kingdom and the Messiah. Haggai prophesied when the remnant of Jews returned to Jerusalem after 70 years of captivity. The theme of his message is the building of the unfinished temple. Zechariah was a prophet to the remnant which returned after the 70 years. Much of his message deals with the first and second comings of the Messiah. Malachi is the last of the prophets to the restored remnant. He also predicts both coming of the Messiah and the love of God for his disobedient people. The New Testament. The Four Gospels. The Four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, record the eternal being, human ancestry, birth, death, resurrection, and ascension of Jesus the Christ, Son of God, Son of Man. They reveal incidents of his life and incidents from his words and works. Taken together, they set forth not a biography, but a personality. These Gospels, through designedly incomplete, though designedly incomplete as a story, are divinely perfect as a revelation from God, and as such, their greatest importance is to set forth a person, that is, Jesus Christ. And the world may trust in him. These narratives can be compared to the evangelist who seldom seeks to describe Jesus, but rather to make him known. Although God himself inspired every word, he permitted the personality of each human writer to be reflected. They told the same story, but each in his own way. That accounts for the variation in certain incidences recorded. There is no cause for the accusation of contradictions, but rather many writers giving testimony provide much more authority to what is written and prove beyond doubt that these were never any collusion among them. The Gospel of Matthew, written by Matthew, a Jew of the Galil or Galilee, and a hated tax collector under the Roman government, was written for the Jews to prove that Christ was their promised king and the fulfillment of Old Testament prophecies of a coming Messiah. The Gospel of Mark, written by John Mark, called either by either name, who was an associate of the Apostles and mentioned in the writings of Paul and Luke, this Gospel sets forth Jesus as the mighty worker, records many miracles he performed, and seems directed to the Gentile reader. The emphasis here is on what Christ did rather than the things he said, and shows Jesus as the great conqueror as well as the servant of the Lord. The Gospel of Luke depicts him as the Son of Man, as well as the Divine Savior. The style is orderly and classical, appealing to the Greek love for beauty, culture, and philosophy. Luke, called the beloved physician by Paul, is the author. 
The Gospel of John, written by the most intimate personal friend of Jesus, the Apostle John, places great emphasis on Christ as the Son of God, co-equal with the Father and the Holy Spirit as deity. The concept is chiefly Jesus' discourses and conversations. The principal words are believe and life. Early Church History The Acts of the Apostles is one of the most important books in the whole New Testament because God makes it clear to man how he works is to be carried forth in the power of the Holy Spirit. With the promised coming of Pentecost and the fulfillment of God's word to men, the apostles in every phase of their ministry are transformed by a new authority and boldness. Jesus has said, I will pray to the Father, and he shall give you another comforter, that he may abide with you forever. John 14, 16. Meek, fearful men whose own handicaps often marred the work of God are transformed into true disciples full of wisdom and power given at the coming of the Holy Spirit. In addition to the descent of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost in Acts 2, other major themes include the ascension and promised return of the Lord Jesus, Peter's use of the keys to the kingdom, the conversion and powerful ministry of the Apostle Paul, the beginnings of the true church as the body of Christ and the calling out of the people for the Lord, the taking of the gospel to the Gentiles in the house of Cornelius and the reception of the Holy Spirit, and the conversion of thousands to Christ as their careful establishment of the faith, all accomplished in the power of the Spirit. The writer does not name itself, but this book along with the Gospel of Luke is accepted as the work of Luke. The Epistles of Paul. Mwah. Key thoughts on these epistles. Romans. The nature of Christ's work, the whole body of redemptive truth and full doctrine. Boy. The nature of Jesus' work, the whole body of redemptive truth and the full doctrines of grace. First and Second Corinthians. Christ's conduct and answers to disorders in the churches, Paul's vindication of his apostleship. Galatians, the complete gospel and salvation by grace alone and not dependent upon human obedience to the law, pure grace. Ephesians, the unity of the church, the believer's position, <clears throat> the truth concerning the body of Christ and the walk according to one's position in Christ. Philippians, a missionary epistle and Christ's experience within the believer. Colossians, the deity of Jesus Christ and Paul's answer to two major problems, legalism and false mysticism. First and second Thessalonians, the second coming of Christ and the confirmation of the young disciples. First and second Timothy, church order, sound faith and discipline, their personal walk and testimony of the believer. Titus, the divine order of the local churches, especially dealing with the churches of Crete or Crete or Crete. Philemon or Philemon. Conversion of a runaway slave, Onesimus, and the teaching of practical righteousness, brotherhood, and love. Other epistles. Key thoughts of these epistles. Hebrews. Christ, the mediator of a new covenant, contrasting the good things of Judaism and the better things of Jesus, thus confirming Jewish Christians a great book of doctrine. James. Necessity of good works to show forth a living faith, some patterns of Christian conduct. First and second Peter, the foundations of the Christian faith with emphasis on the Atonement and encouragement for a persecuted church and prediction of apostasy. First, second, and third John. Love, caution against false teachers and those who reject John's authority. Jude, eminent apostasy and how to detect and deal with it. Prophecy. They even spelled that wrong. Boy, this book must have really been. <laughs> Revelation. The final triumph of Jesus Christ as the complete fulfillment to every individual and nation the close of the age and the coming glory of God and its full revelation, the seven churches, the tribulation, the second advent, the doom of those who reject Jesus, and the ultimate reward for those who receive him, heaven and eternity with God. Free! <laughs> blah, blah, blah! Thank God we're not going to do that in Sunday school, huh? Whew! This has been a long introduction. But at least we got through it. Now you have a summary of the Bible. You have, you know, the bases touched that we like to give credit where credit is due, glory to where glory is due, to honor those that need honor, to do benevolence to those who are, you know, to receive benevolence, to actually be in submission to and subject to those authorities that are above us. And that's why we did what we did with the first three Ooh. Bible Sunday school tapes, because we wanted to 
in the traditions of man and the doctrines of, you know, the church and in Christendom as a whole, submit ourselves to every authority, you know, under God, you know, to do the things that we ought to do to give them credit for what they do. Now, for me, I probably don't go along with a lot of, you know, kind of the summaries because I take it personal. You see, I like to see that I'm in the book of Acts. I like to see that I'm in the book of Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. I like to see me and everything in there because, you know what, I like me. <laughs> At least I like who's in me. And so because I do, I want to take Sunday school to you and to me and to make it applicable to our life, not just some dead doctrine book that, you know, you read it and you go, blah, blah, blah. I'm not into theology. Give me a break, buddy. You know, get somewhere else and go somewhere else with your hermeneutic and homiletic. But we do cover the basis of that, so you at least get an understanding of why so many people get messed up going to Bible school and don't get filled up coming out of school. Because that really is what our purpose is designed for Sunday school, is to be filled up with the Word of God so that we can be blessed up by the Spirit of God so that we can go forth with the witness of Jesus as being the fulfillment of the Godhead bodily in the form of being everything we need, everything we have, and everything we want. Because that's what it's all about, really, is not being so caught up in some theologies, you know, that... Yeah, it's kind of nice to know those things, I guess. I did it. I wasted my time on it. You know, I could get into it with you, you know, and we can even go into the differences between systematic theology and integral specificity. But that's my thing. <laughs> that's another class. For Sunday school, we just want to read comic books. You know, look at the little pictures, you know, and draw in the fill-in of colors, you know. No? Oh, okay, well. But we'll get into, in the study, you know, more of enjoying the Lord, employing the joy of the Lord, involving ourselves in the direction and the reflection of how he shines upon us and he shines within us and how he causes us to see things better than we would have seen them before. And so don't think that this is all dry and dead, although sometimes it feels that way. But rather, look for the resurrection from the dead this next week as we look at the uniqueness of Jesus and we consider well what Sunday school can do for us.